Welcome to Parenting in the Dark. This event is sponsored by PayPal. Are you looking for ways to support your friends, family, or neighbors? PayPal makes it easy to help others who are having a tough time right now. With peer-to-peer -peer payments, you can send money quickly to your loved ones, whether they are nearby or far away. With money pools, you can easily collect funds from many different people to help your community. And with Donate, you can contribute to help support the cause of your choice. Download the PayPal app to start helping today. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Parenting in the Dark. I'm David Gellis, the corner office columnist here at the New York Times, and also the author of Mindful Work, How Meditation is Changing Business from the Inside Out. In just a little bit, we're gonna hear from my colleague, Melena Rizek and the comedian, Tig Notaro. But first, I'm really excited to welcome my friend, Sumi London Kim. She's the Buddhist chaplain at Yale University. Sumi, welcome. Thank you, lovely to be with you. So Sumi, we're both parents. I've got a four and six year old myself. You have a 12 and a 14 year old, I believe. And I think we can all acknowledge that the last few months have not been easy for so many reasons, right? We're trying to work from home. We're trying to take care of the house. And critically, we're trying to be parents. We're trying to take care of our children's emotional needs and their development, our own emotional needs, our partner's emotional needs while keeping a house together. And what else? Trying to bake sourdough bread and keep up with normal people uh, and doom scrolling on Twitter more likely than not. So it's a lot, I think we can all acknowledge. And through all this, certainly myself and so many others are looking for ways to just ratchet down the stress level. Techniques that we can use to interrupt this cycle of reactivity and cope with these deeply unsettling times. And so as a parent yourself and the Buddhist chaplain at Yale University, I'll put the question to you, what can we do? What can we do in this supercharged, super intense time to reduce our own stress? What a great question and one that I have to ask myself all the time. Well, there are a lot of contributors to parental stress, but what I'd like to do tonight is just narrow in on one particular dynamic that I know is in play for me and I suspect is in play for many of the people in our call tonight. And that is to look at the role of expectations. Because we have, on the one hand, expectations uh, for family members, but then there's the reality of how people actually try to meet those expectations. And when there's a gap between the expectation and reality, that's when we start to get frustrated. We start to get a little bit irritated. So for example, I have expectations of my 12 and 14 year old around screen time, around TikTok and Snapchat and the Xbox. And if they go a little bit over time, then I definitely start to feel a little bit irritated. And interestingly, when we look at this gap between expectations and reality, the wider the gap, the more stress we tend to feel. So a few minutes over time, is not a big deal. But if, as happened a few weeks ago when grandma came to babysit for the day, my son played Xbox all day when he knows he's not supposed to, well, let's just say that this mindful mom kind of lost it. Right. So it's really great just to even notice what kinds of expectations we're bringing into our family life. Yeah. Now, one of the very unique things I think about the situation that we're in is that we are now living together 24 seven, mostly 24 seven in the same space. And what that means is that many of us have had to pivot from old routines where we might be going to work and we're going to school to new routines, which include probably a lot more meal making, dishes. I know people have complained that they simply don't even have room in their dishwashers for all the meals that they have to put out every day with everybody in the house. Um, and so we had to create new agreements with each other about sharing space and who gets to do what when and the different responsibilities people would take on. 
in order for us to live harmoniously together in confined quarters. And so what does that mean? That means that we now have many more expectations of each other than we did in our normal circumstances. So we put two and two together, lots more expectations, lots more failures to meet expectations, parents are going to be experiencing more moments of stress throughout the day. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, so, is that something that happens for you? <laughs> certainly. Yeah. A four and a six year old uh, don't always do exactly what you want them to do at any given moment. But, but this, I think, is an important point because I think we have to remember as parents that controlling the emotional equilibrium in the household, it really starts with us. There's this temptation, I believe, to think that if only the kids would behave, if only they would stop the Xbox right at the precise moment we want them to, then everything would be all right. But of course, it's not that simple. So much of what we're talking about comes from developing a sense of acceptance and equanimity. Not getting our kids to do exactly what we want all the time is actually not the answer. I think it's much more critical to figure out how we as parents, as the adults in the room, can appropriately respond with compassion and grace to whatever happens to be going on. So how do we do that? How do we change the expectations of ourselves rather than just trying to foist the responsibility onto our kids to somehow behave better? Yes, that's a great observation. So um, if we have the expectations on the one hand and the reality on the other, we know that the reality is relatively fixed. We, it's very hard to change other people. We even have trouble changing ourselves. So what we want to do to narrow the gap and therefore to reduce the amount of stress is work on the expectation side. And what we can do is to just soften the expectations a little bit. This doesn't mean that we're going to give them all up. It doesn't mean that we're going to no longer have standards or rules, just, you know, whatever happens, it's okay. You know, we, we still need to have these. But what we're really needing to look at is the grip or the attachment that we have around having these expectations met. And what's underneath, the, the psychology that's underneath the, the uh, attachment we have to our expectations is really that at some level we believe that we, our happiness depends on certain conditions being met. That our feeling of safety and well being is dependent on other people um, meeting our exp expectations. So, as you indicated uh, just a moment ago, one thing that we can do is spend some time reflecting on our own psychology, what we're bringing into the situation. And one of the best ways to do that is to spend a few minutes, if we have that, to step to one side and sit quietly, practice a few minutes of meditation. And what that meditation does is it helps to facilitate uh, bringing us into a place of greater calm, clarity, um, equanimity, so that when we turn our attention to what is this difficult dynamic, what is this stress that's arising around expectations, we can have a little bit of insight and we can maybe um, soften around them a little yeah. bit. And so I wonder, Sumi, would you guide us in a few moments of meditation? Yes, I'd love to. Okay. So just wherever you are, feel your body in your seat, or your couch, and I invite you to gently close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. I'm gonna close mine too. And first we get a sense of our body. Often with digital technology and chasing kids around the house, we lose track of our body. So feel your hands in your lap, your sit bones on the surface below, your back pressing against wherever it is. And then I invite you to take a gentle breath in, beginning down in the belly and filling up a bit. And then exhale very slowly, ensuring that your exhalation is a little bit longer than your inhalation. And again, take a gentle breath down in the belly 
And when it's right for you, a slow exhalation, extending the exhalation so that it's a little bit longer than the inhalation. And on your own, go ahead and do a third inhalation, exhalation. And what this does, breathing down in the belly and having a longer exhale, is it activates our parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest or calming part of our nervous system, giving us a little nervous system reset. And then let your breathing go back to its natural rise and fall, however your breathing wants to be. And allow your awareness to rest in the movements of your breathing, reconnecting with your breath. And feeling how the breath moves in your body, reconnecting with your body. And then allowing your awareness to include hearing sounds in your room, hearing the sounds in your home, in the neighborhood and beyond. Hearing these sounds reminds us that we're part of a community, an environment, part of something larger. And then if you like, we can put our hand on our heart and bring into our awareness how we're feeling. What is our state of mind or our mood? It can be anything. We might be feeling excited or fatigued or confused, whatever it is, just notice how we're feeling. And then let your hand go back into your lap. And then take a nice gentle breath in again, exhaling a little longer than the inhalation and opening your eyes and coming back into the space here with the screen. So you can see how just those few mi minutes, I, I feel better, I hope you do as well, how those few minutes can be such a powerful reset so that maybe when we look at what we're bringing into our parenting situation, particularly around expectations, uh, that we come into it with some lightheartedness, some graciousness, more ease, more softness, and maybe even a little bit of humor. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that, Sumi. That was lovely. And I'm so glad you mentioned that at the end because parenting is as difficult and chaotic as it can be, uh, especially in moments like this, it's also one hopes full of joy. And mindfulness can be a powerful tool to uh, sort of subdue that reactivity, but can also be an equally powerful tool to enhance our experience of joy and love and grace and gracefulness and compassion. And I think those are equally powerful things we want to acknowledge, especially at a moment like this. Well, Sumi, thank you so much for your presence this evening. You're so welcome. It was a joy. Thank yeah. you. And now I'm really excited to turn it over to Milena and Tig. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, uh, David and Sumi. That was so great. Uh, I feel more centered already, which is not uh, what you usually feel at a Zoom call, I think. Um, but I'm so excited to, to be here with you guys tonight and to welcome uh, our guest, uh, Tig Notaro, the comedian, to talk about parenting and doing it with a little bit of humor. Uh, we are shamelessly going to ask you for advice. I know you have an advice podcast coming up soon and we're gonna just jump right on that. Um, so a little housekeeping before we get to our conversation, we are gonna have uh, some time for audience Q&A. If you folks watching wanna share a question, just pop right into that Q&A box on your screen and we'll get, to, uh, we'll get to see those in a little bit. Thanks again for joining us, Tig. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to let the audience also in on a little secret, which is that as we were ramping up here, we were all talking, we're all parents, as David said, we were all talking about where we stashed our kids while we did this event. <laughs> we all have, I'm in an entirely different apartment. I had to go to my neighbor's house uh, to do this. I have a three-year-old and a 10-month-old. 
Um, so we're all kind of uh, nimble and negotiating parenting and working at the same time. So Tig, I wanted to start by asking you, what is it that you've been doing in this lockdown pandemic time that you never thought you would ever do as a parent? I know I've been doing a lot more bribing with candy. Um, you know, I've, I, I, before this show started, um, when um, one of the panelists asked me, asked me how old my kids were, I said, they are four-year-old twins. And there was kind of a response of, ooh. <laughs> And um, I have to say that I feel like they've been better than ever because they've had each other and, and we've all been home together. And I think they're really, really thriving off of that. Obviously, we're all human and we have rough moments, but... Um, I would say as far as bribes go though, we did remove them from their preschool. And sometimes we try to make them think it's their reason, their, I don't even know if this is a bribe, but we'll just say to make them think that it's kind of in their control that they're home all the time. Um, Stephanie and I will say, should we, should we all get in the car tomorrow morning and then just drive over and drop you two off at school? And they both are like, no way, we want to stay home. And then Stephanie and I are like, yeah, you know, you're right. Let's just skip it. Let's just stay home again. And so that's kind of what we've been doing to make them think that they're in control. Right, that's the secret, right, is to make the, um, the little people think that they are uh, the powerful ones in the household. Although, of course, in many ways, they are the powerful yeah, ones in the household. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that, it, that brings up a funny point. You know, one thing I, I feel like I was not prepared for as a parent is how much sort of casual lying you do as yeah. a parent. Do you yeah. do that? Yeah, it's weird. Um, I... I actually, another, a bribe, a very clear bribe has now come to mind, and it's, it's a lie. It's, it's a bold-faced lie. Uh, when, when my sons were turning four, and any time they were misbehaving, <laughs> I told them that um, if they didn't behave, I'm going to call the toy store down the street and tell them that they are not behaving as if the person that owns the toy store would care what my children are acting like. But of course, four-year-olds don't know that. They just think that's where toys are. Do not call this guy. Yeah, that person has an outsized influence. Uh, what, what happens when you go in that store now? Do they, are, they, are they like acting very polite to that person? Well, we haven't been in that store. We're on a pretty serious lockdown. And to be totally honest, we haven't, because our sons are four, we haven't even told them about the pandemic. It was, it overlapped right around spring break. And so when everyone thought they were just gonna lock down for a few weeks, um, they were on spring break. And, and then we started to realize that they have no idea what spring break is. And so we've continued to tell them they're on spring break. And because they have no reference point, you know, it's not like they've had previous years of, um, you know, West Palm Beach and, or wherever you go for uh, spring break. Uh, they don't, they have no clue what spring break is. They just think it means being home with us. And so they've been on spring break for four months and when they ask to go to the toy store, we say, um, well, they're closed, everybody, nobody's home, where everybody's on spring break, and then they're like, oh, there's no follow-up questions. They just go back to building Legos. And uh, so it's gonna be an interesting spring break in maybe two years when we actually take them somewhere for a week, like Hawaii or something, they're gonna think it's lame because before, spring break meant staying home and playing for a year or two. Right. That, that is amazing. I mean, that, that 
no sense of time thing really does work in, in your favor. I did tell my child about, about it. And it is a little bit heartbreaking when he says things like, well, when the virus is over, we can go back to, you know, whatever the case, the museum, the library, this child's deepest wish is to go back to the library when the virus is over, which just breaks your heart. And your, so your I child just, is four? Three and a, he's three and a half, yeah. Three and a half, yeah. We just, yeah. they don't, yeah. Our kids don't have a clue. Yeah. See, I, I should have started lying more from the beginning. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, do you feel like, being a comedian and sort of looking for a funny perspective helps you as a parent? Definitely. I think it helps in every angle. And uh, I think what helps me the most is I'm an older parent and um, I'll be 50 next year. And I feel like I'm kind of a grand, I'm a grandparent age. So I feel like I have a, you know, of course I get irritated and, um, and frustrated, but I feel like, you know, when you see grandparents come over and they're just like, oh, <laughs> look at the, when they're acting up. And that's kind of, I feel like a positivity aside from just having a sense of humor is that I've got some years on me and I can have some perspective. Right. Um, the the uh, idea of sort of being a little bit detached from the bad things or the things that you don't want to have happen, like uh, Sumi was talking about that perspective, that tension between expectation and, and reality. Is that something that you carry over from your own, you know, life? Do you feel like you, you were saying it, uh, the comedy perspective helps in that regard too? Is it all of a par of a parcel? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that last part you said. Yeah, I guess I'm just asking, do you feel like that whole perspective about being, having a good um, sense of what, how to measure the gap between expectation and reality, do you feel like that is something that you bring from your life to your parenting and vice versa? Yeah, I think it's kind of inevitable that um, that, that carries over. And um, and just just having, um, well, I was going to go kind of off, uh, uh, talking about, I, I was going to start talking about, uh, living in reality, but then I realized that I just said, I haven't told my kids that there's a pandemic. <laughs> and so what I was about to say doesn't really apply. <laughs> so never mind. This is this is just now we zoom out and realize that the whole thing is a lie, right? <laughs> exactly. Everything's a lie. <laughs> but has it been hard for you personally to, to be this way? I mean, to be at home, you're not on tour as much. You're not obviously in production on things. How have you personally dealt with this? You know, when I realized that it was going to be longer than a few weeks, I started to um, tell myself to act as if I've made this decision for myself, that I chose to stay home, spend time with Stephanie and our children and catch up on house projects and because you know, I've had a lot of health issues over the years. I've toured all around the world for years and been very busy. And whether I've been on tour or lying in a hospital bed, there's been many times where I just thought I would give anything to just be home and spending quality time with my family or um, catching up in life in whatever way that actually can happen. And so that's what I've done is I've just told myself that I've made this decision. And instead, of course, I'm curious when the treatment will be up to par and if there will be a vaccine and checking the news, but trying to stay more present. And that's where I was gonna go of, as much as I can live in reality, even though it's not a reality that I've chosen this, this is my reality now. And so this is um, the way I'm choosing to accept it. And it's, 
you know, so many people, I know there's so many people that have had and are having a horrendous time, but there are other people that are seeing some positive from this and I'm one of them. And, um, and the time that I've been able to spend with Stephanie and our kids is just, I can't even believe how busy I was about to be right before the pandemic started. And I, we have since pulled them out of their spot in preschool and I plan to stay home with them until it's really much safer. So I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to, and to some degree, I feel like succeeding in just living in this reality. That's amazing. That's a really good uh, reminder to just sort of be grateful. Uh, you know, many of us have experienced this in uh, really horrifying ways, and some of us are more privileged. And it's always a good reminder to think about that, um, to think about that perspective and realize that, you know, these are sort of bonus moments. I actually went back to work from uh, maternity leave with my youngest a month before all this hit. So I was in the office for, you know, just four solid weeks um, mm -hmm. before all this hit. And then I basically returned to what a life that was like very similar to maternity leave. You know, people yeah. who were upset about lockdown, I was like, guys, this is what maternity leave is like. You never leave the house. So you always have a child on you. That's uh, that now you know. Well, um, I also think about how, um, I was just saying this to a friend the other day, how just even in the first three months of lockdown, um, aside from just thinking in terms of, of, of children, uh, and again, I know not all kids have the same opportunities, but um, I used to go and spend a summer at my grandmother's house, and I didn't come back, I don't think, um, uh, lacking, uh, even though I was in rural Mississippi, uh, or visiting my cousins. And so, um, I think that it's also giving me time to be very aware of just very, very much in touch with gratitude for what I have and aware of what others do not have and um and trying to stay in touch with with that that said do you ever feel like you have to hide from your family and if so where do you go <laughs> uh well we've created so home. we've created so many different little places nooks and crannies for kids and adults whether it's inside or outside um and uh, I would say where I go to spend time alone does not exist. That it's just, it doesn't exist. It's not until the kids go to bed that there's any hint of being alone. It's not possible. Yeah, I mean, and even then you have to uh, prime yourself for any possible like pop-ups, uh, wake-ups, um, all that kind of stuff. Like the people who were binging on Netflix shows, like not me, I cannot <laughs> do small children. You're like, you can watch a little bit yeah. um, and that's it. I, I wanted to get to some of the questions because I see folks are writing in um, and I want to get to everybody's thoughts. So if I, I'm going to say your name, if I get the pronunciation wrong, I apologize in advance. But um, here we have an audience question. Sarah says, have you seen your children adapt to staying at home in any unexpected ways? Uh, gosh, unexpected ways. I think I just, across the board, I'm just so surprised that they've adapted and because they love their preschool and their friends so much. And we really thought we were going to be in for it with them wanting to get back to school and be around their friends, but they just, it's, 
I think it's really just adapting to this environment that I think our biggest fear is that when the world opens up again to some degree, I don't, I kind of can't picture them leaving our house because they have adapted to this so much and we have them on such a schedule with, you know, hitting all the little nooks and crannies of painting and reading and um, music and, and uh, lunch and the backyard and, and then t we always end the day with uh, TV time. I think that is unexpected. We thought that we'd probably go nuts with letting them watch TV all day. And they're still just ending the day as we always have with the little chunk of time that, um, that we've always, we always allow them like two to three hours a day. And so that's kind of right around what they're staying at. So I'm a little surprised they adapted to just this environment. Do you know all the Daniel Tiger songs by heart too? <laughs> um, I don't. I think Stephanie probably does. Um, but my kids are way more into um, uh, Paw Patrol. They are Paw Patrol obsessed. It's really something. Um, okay, so let's move on to another question. We have Lee who says, how do you handle feeling guilty uh, with work and the kids combined when you want to give them, um, you know, all the time, but you do end up having to work sometimes? Well, Stephanie and I worked out this, um, this uh, schedule where we give each other anywhere from four to six hours a day to just do whatever we want. And um, so she takes her six hours and then I take my six hours. So we're together in the morning at breakfast time as a family. And then I'm with them for four to six hours. And then Stephanie tags in four to six hours. And then we come together for bath time, story time, and bedtime. So that's how we manage to, whether we're, you know, sitting outside or at our desk inside, we just, uh, we tag out. So. And they accept that uh, system? Are they cool with it, your kids? Yeah, we just say um, that we're going to work. And uh, they were used to us going to work before. So um, because nothing's really changed to them, except that they're back from school for spring break. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I think it clocks and makes sense to them that, of course, we still have to go to work. <clears throat> like when I come right. up to the office right now upstairs i'm at work and so they're uh right now is their tv time so they've had dinner and they're watching tv and i'm at work nice um another stephanie a viewer here asks how do you stay positive or even laugh in this kind of difficult environment i mean you know i people would ask me that when I was um, sick and had cancer and I had done stand up with these uh, darker topics, or even around my mother's death. And I think that the only thing I can say is, it's not like I'm walking around like a lunatic, just laughing um, at life or what's going around. Um, but it's just in, in authentic moments that, 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 um, that humor presents itself. Uh, you know, I'm following the news and then there's always these, even on that level with the news, I, I see these news stories that I can't even believe it's a news story in contrast to what's going on. You know, Costco stopped selling 
half sheet cakes was uh, a headline. And I was, I was <laughs> how is this? What, who is, um, is this getting a lot of clicks? It probably is actually, it's probably getting a lot of clicks, but um, I don't know. I, I, there's nothing in particular to point at and say, this is what's funny and this, is, this isn't what's funny. But um, you know, my brain is just wired to uh, see things with a sense of humor. And, and like I said, I'm, through my illnesses and through this pandemic, I'm certainly not just walking around laughing at everything. But at the same time, do you feel like it's sort of necessary to have that sense of release to like, you know, click on the silly story about the Costco sheet cake uh, fiasco? How dare they, you know? Where are we gonna get our birthday party? Oh wait, we don't go to birthday parties anymore, so it doesn't matter. Exactly. Of course. I mean, everything, anything um, mounting like this needs some sort of release. And, and that's, uh, I don't think there should be any, any uh, shame to finding humor where you can find it. Some are better at it than others. Um, I, my wife and I end up on Zoom calls for different work projects that are in limbo and and we we're always amused by how certain projects have people with a sense of humor and then certain projects have people with no sense of humor and it's just that the in itself is is amusing <laughs> how just uh no sense of humor and then we have to kind of recalibrate to be in that. You, what I didn't mention, but you're on Star Trek. Do your kids think that's cool? Uh, yes, they think it's cool. They think outer space is cool. Uh, I've tried to show them uh, me on Star Trek because they think I'm that I really do work in outer space sometimes because uh, I've told them that maybe one day they can come and see the spaceship and then they see me in my mm -hmm. spacesuit and um, and when I tried to show them me on Star Trek they asked me to go back to where the spaceship was <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to they didn't want to see me <laughs> forget you on the bridge go back to the thing that zooms through the stars right even when stephanie's clicking through amazon or netflix and if my something i'm on pops up and my face is there they're they're still like <laughs> no 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 <laughs> just get to paw patrol <laughs> on the double <laughs> they keep you humble that's what they do kids <laughs> It's pretty amazing. Um, uh, we have time for just a couple more questions. I like this question a lot. What, when Aaron asks when it's safe for you and your family and everybody to kind of come out of this period, what conversations will you have uh, surrounding what happened or what routines and rituals do you think you might hold on to from, from this period? There's so much I want to hold on to. Um, I want to, I feel like I was, a selective person prior to the pandemic as far as jobs that I took. And I feel like the filter is, is, is even thicker. It's a, it's a thick filter because the closeness that I have with my kids, it's just, it blows my mind. And so, um, I would love to be able to get up and just hang out with Stephanie every morning and listen to music for an hour. God, I would love that. <laughs> and um, I would love to just stay home with them and let Stephanie go take a job. And, um, and uh, I think she's more eager to get out there into the world than I am. I'm kind of like, I'm happy to stay home. And as far as the uh, conversation that I would have, I would, um, 
<laughs> I, I, I think I'd have to see how my spring break lie progresses because I don't know if this is going to be another year or two years. I don't, I don't know what sort of dark lie I'm going to be getting into with my kids. Um, but I, I think there's going to definitely have to be a conversation about, um, you know, finding that fine line of keeping your space from people, but also being able to connect and be affectionate. And, um, and that's going to be an interesting thing to see when, when life comes back to some version of something. Yeah, absolutely. You want to make sure that you're not, uh, cutting off kids' capacity for empathy or connection in these weird times. Um, Absolutely. SD wants to know, what's your favorite lesson that your kids, your kids have taught you for, during this period? Hmm. The lessons that uh, they have taught me during this period. I mean, it's, it's pretty endless. Um, I think it really, really gets you in touch with flexibility with life. I mean, the pandemic itself makes you, it forces you into flexibility or shifting. And, um, and so that's, I mean, it's on a grand scale and a very focused point. There has to be flexibility and the ability to just shift with life as it goes. And I think it's one of the main lessons my mother taught me. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not like a, some new theory, but she would always say you have to you have to be okay with change or life is going to leave you behind. And I think about it all the time. And as my kids shift and change and life shifts and changes, you have to go with it. And the quicker, and again, this is coming from someone who's deeply lying to their kids <laughs> and, and they think it's spring break. Um, the quicker you live in reality of your life and, and switch with where it's going, I think the quicker happiness appears or can. And, uh, you know, you've done comedy about all these personal things that happen to you. The pandemic is obviously happening to all of us. Do you, I don't know if you're writing now, but do you think Sandella wants to know, do you think the quarantine and the pandemic will impact your, your comedy material? I mean, I don't see how it wouldn't. Uh, I, there's already so much material and, and it's very interesting because I had just, um, I do have a special that's going to be coming out that was already sold and it should be coming out in the next year or so. But after that special sold, I, had a whole new hour of material that I was very excited about. And now I don't even, it's going to be a really interesting journey because I had gotten that new hour of material just right where I wanted it and had, you know, needed tweaking, of course, always, but I have material and then I have this hour that I just worked out and it, it's, I have my work cut out for me, but you know, it's, it's nice to know that material is still being generated. <laughs> um, maybe it won't take the form of stand up. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think in my conversations with artists in this time, I found that people are, you know, if you're a creative person, this, this situation hasn't stopped that. And I think 
those of us who follow your work and follow the work of other artists, we're excited by that. Um, so thank you for thinking about this and, and making us laugh. And um, thank you guys. That was the last question we had time for. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, David and Sumi. Thank you so much, Tig. Um, and again, you have a new podcast called Don't Ask Tig, an advice show coming out on July 22nd. Yeah. Now we know that your main piece of advice is to lie to naive and innocent children. Uh, um, but it works, you know. But also, uh, make sure to look. But also, to as much as you can cram in living in reality while you're lying to children, <laughs> I'm all for it. It's a delicate balance, you know, it's that tightrope walk. Yeah. Uh, we're all living in that moment, that na negotiation and balance. So thank you guys all for joining us. It's been really terrific to chat with you. I've learned a lot. Thank you all, David, Sumi, and Tig. Have a good night. Thanks for having me. See ya.